Welcome to Passport for Dog Breeding Success, a webinar with Revival's Director of Veterinary Services, Dr. Marty Greer. We are excited to have Dr. Greer with us. Dr. Greer has more than 35 years of experience in veterinary medicine with special interests in both pediatrics and reproduction. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Greer. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And it's really fun to be here. So thanks to everybody. I hope you can all hear me okay. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I also, in addition to practicing veterinary medicine, am a dog breeder, like many of you. So I um, live in the same lives that you do. So for uh, I did have one client I could talk to at Revival a couple of months ago, and she said, you veterinarians, you don't really understand this. And I said, well, uh, you, might, you might be a little bit off on this veterinarian. So this is a picture of my dear husband holding Miranda and her litter of puppies. We had this litter of puppies seven years ago. Um, the second girl from the left is Patty. And Patty won our national in 2016. So we're pretty proud of our breeding program. We've had a pretty good run. This afternoon, we're gonna talk about progesterone and vaginal cytologies to time breedings, prenatal care, puppy count x-rays. These are the five Ps. Um, preparation for whelping and planned C-sections. Semen analysis actually doesn't fit in here, so we're not going to include semen analysis today. We can do that in another topic. So progesterone testing. We're gonna talk about why progesterone and why should we progesterone test? How do you vet, use vaginal cytology? How to time the breeding, how to time the whelping, and how to time the C-section. So progesterone testing. Progesterone is the hormone that we have as a veterinary community decided that is going to be the most effective test that we have. It's going to tell us when we can breed our females. It's going to vary the, with the type of semen, how we interpret the results and with the type of insemination. So it's really important that we have all this information when a veterinarian or you are trying to use progesterone testing to help time a breeding, we need to know all that information. So progesterone testing has turned out to be the most effective hormone in timing breedings. So this little graph on the bottom, and I owe this graph, I did not draw this, this is from Bruce Iltz who retired from um, the vet school in Louisiana. Uh, so as you can see, this is a graph of the female's heat cycle. So as a female comes into heat, the first thing that happens during the start of her heat cycle is her estrogen rises. So that's the red line that goes up and then drops back down. So estrogen rises at the beginning of her heat cycle. As the estrogen rises, her vaginal tissues start to cause cornification, and we'll show you slides of what that looks like under the microscope. So that's how we can assess on a vaginal cytology that a female is coming into heat. So estrogen rises, vaginal cornification starts. Shortly after estrogen rises, we see an LH surge or an LH peak. LH stands for luteinizing hormone. LH, luteinizing hormone, is actually the hormone that causes ovulation to occur. That's what tells the ovaries to release the eggs and to the oviducts, and that's what ovulation really happens. So for a number of years, we had LH testing available to us. It was a test kit, um, and you can still purchase them, but for a number of years, we couldn't get them at all. So at that point, LH testing in our clinic just sort of fell off because when you couldn't get the kit and you couldn't run the test, it really wasn't helpful. The other problem with LH testing is that it requires testing every 24 hours to catch that very narrow peak. So as you can see, estrogen goes up on a wide graph and then drops down widely. And then we see progesterone go up, but it goes up slowly. It's kind of wobbles at the baseline and then it goes up slowly. And once progesterone goes up, it stays up for 63 days. So estrogen isn't that helpful. There's no commercial lab that runs it. LH is helpful, but requires 24 hour intervals of testing. And I don't know very many clients or very many dogs who wanna have their blood drawn every 24 hours and need to be at the veterinary clinic. So say you pick eight o'clock as your time on Tuesday, it has to be eight o'clock Wednesday, eight o'clock Thursday, eight o'clock Friday. Not very comfortable, not very easy. What happens on Saturday and Sunday if your vet clinic is closed? So you really don't have access to LH on a daily basis. So that's how progesterone kind of evolved is, and it's mostly, I'm gonna probably credit Dr. Hutchinson at the Ohio um, Veterinary Clinic that he's at Northview to say that he did a tremendous job of some of this initial work and getting uh, statistical analysis done to try and correlate 
when progesterone was at what level that was going to create a good opportunity for fertile breedings. So when we first started freezing canine semen and doing breedings on females, we didn't have the information on this. We didn't really have the ability to progesterone test and know what to do with those results. So they used to do multiple surgical breedings before there were two, two CCIs and taking a girl to surgery more than once for a breeding was pretty rough, you know, to have multiple surgeries within a day or two of each other. So we've really come a long way in the last uh, 30 and 40 years since uh, we really started freezing canine semen and progressed with that. So as you can see, the LH peak goes up and back down, progesterone goes up and it correlates with the LH peak. So when we see progesterone start to rise and it goes from a two to somewhere in the five to eight range, we know that's when ovulation took place. Ovulation in the dog is different than ovulation in other species. Cows, cats, horses, people, when they ovulate an egg, it's ready to fertilize. Dogs need maturation of the egg before it's ready to fertilize. So that's why we don't breed the day of ovulation. That's why we breed two days after ovulation with fresh or natural breedings and three days after ovulation with frozen breedings. So that kind of gives you an idea of how this whole thing works. And progesterone will have some wobble on the baseline before the progesterone gets above three. And so we have a lot of clients that will get a 1.2 and then they'll get a 0.8 and they throw up their arms in despair and they're like, oh my gosh, this is never gonna work. She's not gonna ovulate. I missed her, this is horrible. And the answer to that is really, that's not the case. What's really the case is until they get to three and above, there is baseline wobble. The baseline does a little bit of this. You can see that yellow dotted line just kind of goes jiggity jaggedy up and down. But once she gets above three, it rises and it progressively rises and stays up for 63 days. Pregnant or not pregnant, the progesterone rises and it stays high for 63 days. So it's a really great test for us to be able to run and it's available in many veterinary clinics. And if it's not, it's always available in the reference labs that we can send them out. So, <clears throat> We use receptivity of the female as one of our parameters. We use progesterone tests. We can use vaginal cytologies. We've talked about LH. We'll talk about vaginal, vaginoscopy and I'll talk about reverse progesterones, which is when people use progesterone at the end of the pregnancy to time when the puppies are due or when the C-section is done. So receptivity, yes, we'll see males that are more interested as the female approaches her fertile period. We'll see females that are more receptive. And yes, I really do have clients that dress their dogs up. This is not a picture from the internet. This is a picture from one of my clients. She had both the male and the female. They obviously got married before they had their breeding. So using vaginal cytology, it tells us a couple of things. One is it helps us to time when we wanna start progesterone testing. So if we see strong evidence of proestrus, we may not wanna do a progesterone at the first visit. If we need to know if she's even in heat, because we do have people that come in and they say, well, she keeps herself really clean. I'm not sure if she's in heat or not. Can you progesterone test her? The answer is sure, but we can also use a vaginal cytology to help us determine if she's in a heat cycle at all. And then the third thing we can use vaginal cytologies for is other pathology. Is there a tumor in her vaginal tract? Does she have an infection, a vaginitis or a uterine infection? So those are all really useful things to see. Using vaginal cytology does require a microscope slide, a cotton swab, some particular stains, some special stains and a microscope. So for people that have a microscope, we can teach you to do this. If you don't have a microscope, then you can have your veterinarian do this. And the slide at this point in pro estrus, so early in the heat cycle, so she has a bloody vaginal discharge, but she's not yet ovulated. You're gonna see these big round cells that have a big purple nucleus in them. Those are epithelial cells. People call these parabasal cells or just uncornified or non-cornified epithelial cells. These epithelial cells are all, they look like a fried egg. They are all signs that she's still in pro estrus. And then the background cells in here are uh, red blood cells. And those are normal to see in pro estrus because she has a bloody vaginal discharge. And then these little purple dots are bacteria. Now, some people get a little freaked out about bacteria, but there should be bacteria in the bitch's vaginal tract at this point in her heat cycle. It's normal flora, normal bacteria, just like you have flora on your skin, flora in your intestinal tract. She should have bacterial flora in her vaginal um, tract as well to protect her against any kind of um, bacterial infection from pathogens. So it is normal to see bacteria there and seeing that bacteria does not mean that you should start an antibiotic. That is absolutely normal to see. So as we go along through estrus, this is where she's actually in estrus, estrus, E-S-T-R-U-S, not E-S-T-R-O-U-S. 
OUS is the heat cycle, US is the fertile part of the heat cycle. So you can see these epithelial cells are now larger, they're more angular looking, they're staining darker. Many of them have lots of their nucleus, so they don't look like fried eggs anymore, they look like potato chips. So always correlate with food because people understand what potato chips and fried eggs look like. So this is where we see the bacteria pretty much gone, the red blood cells are pretty much gone. We just see these big epithelial cells. And there's probably a good reason for the female to have this kind of change in her vaginal cytology. This means that her vaginal lining is thickened and it's more capable of withstanding comfortably the 20 minute tie that she may have to withstand during the time that she's being bred. Then we get into diesterous. This is after ovulation. So again, the cells become more round. They have their nucleus back. They return to this fried egg appearance and the background cells don't have red blood cells anymore, but these are white blood cells. That is normal after ovulation. Again, not a reason to get alarmed. And then we go into anestrus, which is the four month period between heat cycles. Again, these are normal epithelial cells. The color difference is just based on different staining, but you can still see that they're these big fried egg looking cells. Absolutely normal. Now on cytology, this bacteria on the left-hand portion, that's completely normal. But if proesterous, before she ovulates, if you see these neutrophils, these white blood cells, that's an indication of infection. So if you see those in proesterous, that's a reason to put a female on an antibiotic. Seeing bacteria is not. So it's really important that you're talking to your veterinarian about appropriate management of this dog's heat cycle. This is the equipment that you need. You need a microscope slide. You need stains that will make the stain of the cells different colors. You'll need a microscope, which runs several hundred dollars, and then you'll need cotton swabs. So pretty easy to get this equipment and get this set up. There are plenty of opportunities online to do that. And then the LH test looks like this, just so you know, this is the little cartridge that we run. Again, simple to run. We put a drop of serum here, and then you get lines across this uh, device where it reads on the membrane based on whether she has an LH surge or not has an LH surge. So again, we can LH test at this point, but in our practice, we typically don't because it required 24 hour testing. Vaginoscopy, um, this is looking at the vagina with a scope. These are slides from Dr. Schultz in Michigan. So I appreciate his slides. This is what the female looks like before she ovulates. So you can see this red, a gemitous, shiny looking surface. It becomes less red, more of a tan color and more cornified during the time that she's actually in the fertile period. This is when her progesterone was 14. And then it returns back to this color. So we can see these progression of changes on vaginoscopy. Now we can do vaginoscopy in our practice with the transcervical insemination scope, but you can use a proctoscope. And these are old used equipment from um, years past. Very few um, f f uh, physicians use these anymore. But this is a simple piece of equipment that illuminates and you can take a look in the bitch's vagina and see what her vaginal tract looks like. So ovulation timing, we want to use progesterone timing both to time when she ovulates, but ovulation timing, if it's done pr properly and, and effectively and frequently enough, we can also time when she's going to either whelp or have a C-section. So that would be getting her unpregnant. So we need it to get her pregnant and we need, her to, need it to get her unpregnant. So Unpregnant is actually the name of a movie. I didn't make that up. I haven't watched it yet, um, but we call that reverse progesterone. Um, this is a, a llama or a push me, pull you. Remember the old Dr. Doolittle series, uh, push me, pull you. So we test on the front end of the pregnancy to get her pregnant and we test on the back end of the pregnancy to get her unpregnant. Now, if we have good timing on the front end, I don't need progesterones on the back end. But for people that have, for whatever reason, not adequately timed their females, then we may need to do progesterone testing on the back end to see when she's due. So different kinds of breedings require different timing and different kinds of um, semen require different insemination techniques. So a natural breeding obviously is always gonna be fresh semen. If we're going to do a vaginal insemination that has to be either fresh semen or fresh chilled semen, semen that was shipped to us fresh, but not frozen, if we're going to do frozen semen, we have to use either transcervical insemination or surgical breeding. Now you can also do TCI with fresh semen and you can do TCI with fresh chilled semen. So you don't have to um, do a TCI unless you're using frozen semen, but it is a great tool if we want to improve litter size or if we have a female with low fertility or a male with poor semen quality, by delivering the semen with transcervical insemination directly into the uterus, we get better uh, outcomes as far as pregnancies go. 
Surgical breedings can be done by almost any veterinarian. Transcervical inseminations require some fairly expensive and specialized equipment with some ex extra training. But I'll show you a video of that and you can um, kind of figure that out with your veterinarian as well. Uh, some people deliberately and some people accidentally have multiple sire breedings, meaning that they have more than one father on a litter. That doesn't impact future litters, but it is important if you do have more than one stud dog involved in a breeding that you're DNA testing and you know exactly who the father of the litter is before you register puppies if you do have a registry that you're using. So progesterone, how do we interpret those results? Well, that in part depends on the machine. Usually ovulation is between four and eight. We typically call it about five in our practice, but four to eight is the range most people use. And we'll see a rapid jump or almost a doubling of the progesterone level when we know she's ovulated. So again, here's a slide that shows us that the progesterone can wobble on the baseline. Once she gets to ovulation, it starts to rise and it rises rather smartly. The larger bitches tend to rise more steeply. Smaller bitches tend to rise on a lower, slower basis. But nevertheless, we know two days after ovulation, she's in a fertile period for fresh semen and three days for frozen semen. So in our practice, the magic numbers are five. And then the other magic number is 20. For frozen semen, we wanna see her progesterone above 20. With fresh semen, we typically see it two days after ovulation at around eight to 15. For frozen breedings, three days after ovulation, it's around 20 or above. The egg in the dog needs time to mature. And the progesterone testing that you're doing must be from a reliable laboratory. So you wanna to try to use the same lab every time. Now there are quantitative progesterone tests and semi-quantitative progesterone tests. Quantitative progesterone test, this is a TOSO, this is a mini vitus. Some of the breeders have both of these machines. This will give you a number. This prints out 2.43, it'll print out 5.87. That's a quantitative number. Semi-quantitative is a well or a membrane color change. It's pinker than yesterday. There's a blue dot that there wasn't there yesterday. Those are semi-quantitative. They're okay, but they're not good enough to use frozen semen and they're not good enough to time surgical readings and they're not good enough to do C-sections based on. So I want actual numbers in my world when I'm doing a planned surgical breeding, a planned frozen semen breeding, or a planned C-section. This is another piece of equipment that also is very effective. It's called a V-check by BioNote, another really great piece of equipment, and we'll talk about that um, at another time. So again, any of these pieces of equipment can give us the information, but different machines have different interpretations, uh, particularly the mini, mini vitus or mini vetus. Um, different results come off of different machines. So you need to know what the number on that machine means compared to the machine that they run at the diagnostic lab like IDEX or Antec, because they're not always the same number. The number we get off of our catalyst and our, our IDEX or off of our um, TOSO, a five is a five is a five. But if you're using a mini vitus, their five might be an eight on someone else's machine. So it's really important that you know which piece of equipment you're using and what the interpretation of that machine is. So important we know that. Now, transcervical inseminations, I talked about that a little bit. And I'm gonna show you what transcervical inseminations look like. Um, this is an Airedale and this is her owner that's walking her onto our um, lift table. The table's coming up and we're gonna do a transcervical insemination. So like I said, any veterinarian that can do a spay can do a surgical breeding and put in fresh semen or frozen semen. The tricky part then is to get the timing right and to thaw the semen correctly. So those are where it gets a little tricky. With frozen semen or fresh semen and doing transcervical insemination, the equipment is a little more sophisticated. We don't do it surgically. The dog is obviously awake. She's standing on the table. Her owner is standing in front of her. And this is Marissa holding the dog and Brenda holding the scope in my practice. That's me in the middle. Um, and I'm gonna show you what a transcervical insemination looks like just so that you can see it. So some of you may have veterinarians that do this and you haven't seen it because you've been in the car during COVID and they wouldn't let you into the veterinary clinic to see. Others of you may um, not have ever seen transcervical insemination and you wanna know if your veterinarian will do this, can do this, uh, that type of thing if they have the equipment. So the challenge to it is it takes some practice to get good at it because it's sort of like playing a video game only inside of a dog. And the other challenge to it is it's expensive equipment. It's around $40,000 to get the entire setup. So if you go to a veterinarian that does tons and tons of repro, they probably can justify the uh, cost of the equipment and the training experience that they need. If you're going to a veterinarian and you're the only breeder that uses them or there aren't very many breeders, you're gonna find that they're probably not going to be able to justify the cost of the equipment. 
It's super cool. It's really fun to do. Um, these are these are fun procedures. My doctors that do them really like doing canine reproduction with transcervical inseminations. One of them is they, they like doing it because like I said, it's like playing a video game. The other that's cool about it is they really like not taking a dog to surgery if they don't need to. So if we can avoid any surgical procedure, it's really a great thing. So we can do these on any size dog. This is a nice middle sized 45 pound dog, but we can do them on little itty bitty dogs that weigh three pounds and we can do them on great big dogs that weigh 200 pounds. So it is possible to do this. So this is me just getting the scope ready and making sure that it's focused. We've put a little shunt or a plastic device in her vagina that holds some air so that we can add air in front of the scope and see where her cervix is. The TV screen that's um, next to Brenda is what I can see on the screen where the scope is. Unfortunately, the kind of medical um, monitor that it is, it doesn't show up especially well on video cameras. Um, for some reason, you get a lot of weird black lines through it. It's just the way it is. So we put the scope in the female's vagina, and then we're gonna add a little bit of air to the vaginal tract so we can see better. I've now got the cervix in view. Cat the catheter that Brenda just handed me is going to be fed into the scope. We're gonna slide it in, and then I'm gonna see where the openings of the cervix is, and I'm gonna line up and aim for it. Um, the cervix actually is angled at about a 70 degree angle. So the scope has a corresponding angle on the end of it. You can just see the end of the um, catheter there on the TV screen. So if you're looking, you can see the catheter. I'm in the cervix. Now I'm gonna advance the catheter all the way in so that we're up in the uterine body. So Brenda's pointing to it so that the owner can see it. Then there's a little wire in the middle of it. We pull that wire out and leave the catheter in. We put this little device on that allows the syringe to attach to the catheter. And then Brenda's gonna hand me the syringe with the semen in it. And we will slowly put the semen into the female's reproductive tract completely up in her uterus. So the semen doesn't have to swim very far. It's already up in the uterine horn where the semen in just a, like an inch or two is all they had that it has to swim to get up to the ovaries. So it's actually a really cool technique. So just so you see what TCIs look like. So like I said, the push me, pull you, it reminds us that we need to time our girls for the beginning to get them pregnant and we need to time them at the end to get them unpregnant. So uh, C-section timing, we'll typically do our C-section 62 days after ovulation for most dogs or 61 days for the bulldog breeds, the bullies, the pugs, the French bulldogs, or females with an especially large litter. So if I have a golden retriever that's pregnant with 14 puppies, I'm gonna do her C-section on day 61. If I have a golden retriever that's pregnant with three puppies, I'm gonna do her C-section on day 62. So that kind of gives you an idea of how we interpret. So instead of having to come into the veterinary clinic for reverse progesterones every single day, again, on a daily basis, it gets to be a bit of a drag for you and for the dog then we don't need to do reverse progesterones. We know when her C-section should be scheduled and we can put her on the books and go ahead and do her C-section. Um, if we're doing reverse progesterones, we want the progesterone to be below two, but I like all the stars to be aligned. That means I want the ultrasound to show that there's maturity of the fetus looking at the intestines and the kidneys of the puppies. Yes, we can actually see those. I wanna see that she's doing some nesting. I wanna see that she's producing milk. I wanna know on x-ray that the skeletons look mature. I want all the stars to align. So I'm not counting on just one parameter because taking puppies too early is dangerous. Um, it's not dangerous for the female, but it certainly is for the puppies. If we have puppies born more than two days before their due date, they aren't going to have mature lungs. They're not going to survive. So we need to be absolutely certain that our timing is good. So the disadvantages to reverse progesterone are number one, veterinary scheduling. If your staff has to come in on Saturday and Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and see if you're ready to go yet, that gets to be a little annoying to the veterinary staff. My staff wants to know how many C-sections do we have today? Last week on Sunday, we did three. That's the way it is. Um, this coming Monday, I have two scheduled. It's really nice for the veterinary team to know how many C-sections they have scheduled so that they can appropriately schedule other appointments around it. Number two is inaccuracies. We can see some females that have their progesterone drop prematurely because there's something wrong with the pregnancy or something wrong with her ovaries ability to produce progesterone. So if her progesterone drops prematurely and we're assuming that the progesterone is accurate, but it drops below two, and it's really because she's trying to abort the litter, not because the, the puppies are at full term, that can lead to a disaster. 
Number three is increased cost. It costs you more money if you go to the vet clinic every day. And we actually had a client that had a breeding at his house with his own male and his own female. So we knew they were purebred puppies, but he was unaware that a breeding had taken place. He was out of town. His son was taking care of the dogs. His son, who was 50, was taking care of the dogs. And he didn't know that the female was even pregnant until she started to look big. And every day for 10 days in a row, he came in and had a progesterone test run until we got her to the point that we knew her progesterone was low enough and it was time for her to have her C-section. That was on New Year's Day. So my staff was in there every single day for 10 days, including coming in on New Year's Day to help with his C-section. And our clinic, like most clinics on New Year's Day, are closed. So it meant my staff had to schedule their, their life around that. Number four is it's increased travel. So if you can progesterone test every three days to find when she ovulates and know what day to do your progesterone at the end and know what day to do your C-section at the end, it's much less expensive than driving to the vet clinic every single day for 10 days in a row. The last thing is, of course, it requires last minute arrangements if you don't know when she's due to have her C-section. So that can be a lot of stress and trouble for the veterinary team to get together. The current state of veterinary care in most practices is we have staff shortages. Most veterinary clinics are operating at about a 25% staff shortage deficit. We're starting to see staff burnout. What is milk and cookies on this screen for? That's because you need to be really, really nice to your veterinary team and their staff. So please make sure you're treating them kindly, that you're being nice to them. And remember, many of your vet techs are skipping lunch to get your C-section done. So if you take in a box of cookies or a pie or you know something really delicious for them, that might be their only lunch break for the whole day. And they're gonna be a lot more appreciative of your needs if you can help them out with that. So that's it on timing the breeding. Next, we're gonna talk about prenatal care. The first thing I wanna talk about is food. Food, I'm gonna recommend that you're either feeding a performance diet, which would be like a Purina Sport 3020 or a puppy diet. Um, I really like those diets. I really also like HT42D, which is Royal Canin's diet. That is the only company that makes a pregnancy dog food. So if you're struggling with infertility or you're struggling with other issues, this pregnancy diet can be really helpful. Um, it's a great diet. I feed this to my own per uh, personal bitches. And it comes as two sizes. It comes as a large breed and a small breed. You can only buy it from their website. You cannot buy it at the retail store. So sign up for their breeder account, get it ordered. Right now, every pet food company is having some supply chain issues because of COVID. So if you think you're gonna breed a female in March, start getting your food ordered now so that you have it in inventory when you need it. But there are micronutrients in this food that are specially designed to support pregnancy. It supports um, behavioral changes during heat. It supports the growth of the eggs. It supports fertilization, the formation of the embryos and the formation of the placentas. So this food is fed from the start of the heat cycle to the 42nd day of pregnancy, thus the name HT for heat and 42D for 42 days. So terrible name for a dog food, awesome dog food. So if you're struggling with fertility, take a look at this food to improve the quality of your bitch's heat cycles and their fertility. Um, the other alternative that I feed if I don't feed the Royal Canin Puppy or Royal Canin HT42D is the Purina Sport Performance 3020. It is an all stage life stage. It is meant to be for a high performing dog. So it will support pregnancy and puppy growth. So you're gonna say to me, well, I looked at the label and the labels all look the same. They, what I'm feeding is just as good. And the answer is it probably isn't. Um, macronutrients like fats, carbohydrates, and proteins are easy for you to take a look at on the um, label and see what the percentages of the food are. But the micronutrients don't tell the whole story. The vitamins and minerals that are listed here on this slide are in micro quantities. And if you're looking at this, you can see that those are things that aren't typically on your pet food company's label. So it's much better to feed a pregnancy diet or a performance diet. We see better fertility. And if you're having fertility issues and you call and ask to, to talk to me, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, what do you feed? The second thing I'm going to ask you is, have you brucellosis tested? So that pretty much sums up the two first questions we're going to have. Raw meat diets. This is how I feel about them. I don't think I need to say much more other than please don't do it. I feel like it's kissing a pig. You're going to have bacteria. You're going to have parasites. There's just a lot of things that go wrong with raw meat diets. And then the grain-free or carbohydrate-free diets. We need our females to have carbohydrates to grow their puppies and they need carbohydrates to lactate. So please avoid the grain-free diets. You need to have um, grains in them, wheat, corn, oatmeal, millet, soy. Those are all absolutely fine for dogs to eat. 
So please don't be feeding a raw, or a raw meat diet or a grain-free diet. For our prenatal care, we want them to be on suppl supplements. I like the Oxymate during the early start of the heat cycle. This does support a lot of the um, nutrition that they need for pregnancy and, and um, birthing. Folic acid is seen in some of our supplements and that's a very important nutrient to have, particularly if you have the brachycephalic breeds of dogs like the Frenchies and the Bulldogs. Um, this is a little puppy that had the trifecta of midline defects. So a midline defect is anything that affects the formation of the puppy where right side and left side have to come together. The classic one is the cleft palate or where the palate doesn't fully fuse in the center. Um, so the picture on the right is a puppy with a cleft palate. So if you have a puppy that's born that's having milk come out of the nose or they're not nursing effectively, the first thing you wanna do is take a look at the palate and see if there's any kind of a defect in it. But this puppy had three midline defects. She had the midline defect in her mouth. The red dot over her shoulders was a spina bifida lesion where her spinal cord didn't adequately fuse. And the third defect is her intestinal tract was outside her body wall. Her body wall did not close correctly. So on her left side, on the downside of the picture is her placenta. If you look between her feet and her tail, you can see her intestines. So this puppy had all three midline defects. Folic acid is very important, especially in the brachycephalic breeds that the bitches are on adequate amounts of um, folic acid. And this needs to be started about six weeks before she's bred. So if you're planning to breed a female, you don't wanna start this the day she comes into heat. You wanna start it prior to the time she comes into heat. This is a really nice study that came out of Poland. It shows that in two breeds, the pug and the chihuahua, that are dogs that are predisposed to having midline defects like cleft palates, that supplementing folic acid reduce the risk of cleft palate in these two breeds by um, 50 to 66%. So they went from 10 to five and went from 15 to 5% uh, puppies with cleft palates with simply changing the folic acid, not by changing their genetics. So if you do have genetics that tend to do this, please, please, please take a look at folic acid. DHA is another nutritional supplement I like to see people use. Um, DHA was discovered to create smarter puppies and better retina development for better vision. Um, this work was done by Russ Kelly at the IMS company, uh, great material. So DHA we know helps puppies to be smarter. You will now see things like smart puppy on the label of pet foods because they are supplementing DHA in puppy food, but it's important to even start it on the bitches when they're um, getting ready to be bred for their pregnancies. So we know more about this from a study that was done with the IMS company and Canine Companions for Independence, CCI. This is an organization that raises service dog puppies. I have raised uh, six of their puppies and my son is now raising his first, he's 35 and raising his first CCI puppy. So they found on litter number one out of the um, bitches that were in their breeding program that 50% of their puppies were graduating as service dogs. But by the fifth litter, they were down to a 25% graduation rate. It was determined that it was DHA depletion. So by adding DHA to the bitch's diet and adding DHA to the puppy's diet, we know that we can improve their, their brain development and their retina development. And what's really cool is if you look at baby formula labels, they put DHA in baby formula now too, for the very same reason. It improves brain development, it improves eye development, and there's no detrimental effect. It doesn't damage joint development or anything else. There've been really extensive studies showing how important this is. So I have had clients that have started adding DHA to their bitches diets, and they do come in and say, I've never had such smart puppies. The other thing that you need to know is DHA will reduce the risk of you developing dementia. So write this down. If you don't write anything else down during this lecture, write down DHA, because you need to go to the store or order it online and start getting DHA for yourself because it will reduce your risk of dementia. None of us want to have dementia as we age. Next is our Be Strong product. Love, 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 be strong. I don't know exactly how this magic works, but I will tell you that if we have females that are having poor fertility or not having regular six month cycles, adding nothing other than D be strong to their diet and the appropriate diet of either Purina or Royal Canaan will bring bitches into heat. It's like magic. So if you're struggling with fertility, struggling with um, infrequent heat cycles, I start them on be strong, the label directions are correct. So you start adding this to the bitches diet and typically within two to four weeks, we'll see bitches come into heat and start cycling. Next, I think it's really important that our females are on probiotics as well as the puppies. The Doc Roy's GI Symbiotics comes as a paste, very easy to give to newborn puppies. Um, you can put a little dab on their tongue. It's important to get the right bacteria in their gut. 
We also know from some of the meetings that were presented prior to COVID that we can see less mastitis and less metritis, which is an infection in the uterus in our females if they are on a probiotic. So again, if you're seeing mastitis or metritis frequently in your line of dogs, don't start using antibiotics. Bathe the bitch before she comes into labor and have her good and clean so that she's less likely to get an infection and have her on a probiotic, you're gonna be in better shape. Next is body condition score. Very important that our bitches are at the appropriate body condition. I don't want my bitches too thin and I don't want them too heavy when we're trying to get them pregnant. So my best rule of thumb on this is either have a scale in your kennel that you can weigh the dogs or you can teach your kennel staff or your spouse or your partner or whoever. This little trick is when you put your hands on the female, the back of your hand is what the rib cage should feel like if you run your fingers, fingers across it. If you run your fingers across your knuckles and you can feel those bumps, that's a female that's too thin. And if you push on the heel of your hand and she feels like that, she's too fat. So too fat is the heel of your hand, too skinny is your knuckles, and just right is the back of your hand. So use that as your body condition score tool. Then heartworm preventives. I think bitches should all be on heartworm preventives, but I try to time it so that you give the first, progest or first um, heartworm pill at the start of her heat cycle, you give the next one three to four weeks later so that you've missed the first three weeks of her uh, pregnancy. That's the first trimester when most fetal development takes place. And make sure that anything that you're giving for heartworm or flea and tick prevention says it's safe for use in breeding dogs. It doesn't say pregnant dogs. It doesn't say female dogs. It doesn't say male dogs. It says breeding dogs. Very important that you're paying attention to that. Most heartworm preventives other than trifexis are safe. However, a lot of the flea and tick products are not. So we wanna look very carefully at the label. HeartGuard is safe, the injectable ProHeart is safe, Interceptor, all those are safe. Flea and tick preventives are different. A lot of the topicals are not safe because those translocate across the female's body and onto the mammary glands and onto the puppies. So be careful with that. And then on the um, oral products, Brevecto is safe, but Semperica, NextGuard, and uh, ne NextGuard and Credelio, those three are not tested in breeding animals. So Brevecto is the only one that is labeled for use in breeding dogs. Support the companies that support your breeding program and don't use drugs that you don't know about. It must say safe. Now, if your veterinarian has sent home a product that isn't safe or you want to check on it, Google product insert and the name of the product. You don't have to be a veterinary professional. It will show up that there's a Freedom of Information Act, you have to be able to access that product label. So pull it up, it's on a PDF. It's usually teeny tiny, but on your computer screen, you can expand it enough to read the label and see if it says safe for use in breeding dogs. If it doesn't, don't use it. I don't want your dog to be the footnote in the paper where they start talking about defects that they saw in a breeding program because of a product that wasn't tested as safe. Next will be intestinal parasites. We're all aware of worms in our dogs, but what you may not be aware of is if your female ever had roundworms when she was a puppy or at any stage in her life, during her pregnancy, those um, parasites that insisted in her muscles will reactivate because of the stress of pregnancy, migrate through her bloodstream across the placenta and into her puppies. The same thing will happen with hookworms, except they will migrate through the bloodstream and through the mammary glands and into the milk. So this is how puppies are born with parasites. So roundworms through the placenta, hookworms through the milk, and then into the puppies. So what do we do about that? Well, we can use fenbendazole very safely during pregnancy, during the last three weeks of pregnancy through the first two weeks of lactation, and it will very effectively block that migration. So you can prevent the migration of roundworms and hookworms into the puppies by using fenbendazole for five weeks. The label says three days. This protocol says five weeks. This protocol was published 20 years ago. If anybody wants the protocol um, resource for their veterinarian, I'm happy to send it to you. But the dose is basically one cc of the suspension per, 10, or per four pounds of body weight. It's a 10% solution, one cc per four pounds of body weight. So a 10 pound dog would get two and a half cc's a day. A 60 pound dog would get 12 cc's a day. You may have to mix it with Splenda or um, something sweet or peanut butter or something to get her to take it. If you're unclear on how to calculate the dose, please call, we can help you with it. But we can tell you that doing this for the five weeks will prevent that migration. So instead of at weaning when your puppies are three weeks old, 
and you're trying to get them off of the mom and onto solid food and onto water and starting to make that transition and they all get diarrhea and they all feel crummy and you end up going to the vet for an appointment, you can completely prevent that if you're using the appropriate dose of fenbendazole. That's Panicure. Um, it's the same thing as Safeguard. It also takes care of Giardia. So fenbendazole is safe in, in puppies that are over uh, six weeks of age. Metronidazole you want to avoid in puppies under eight weeks of age, and you want to avoid metronidazole in pregnant females. So fenbendazole during pregnancy for uh, Giardia, for roundworms, and for hookworms. Coccidia is the only drug I'll recommend for, uh, or Elbon is the only drug I'll recommend for coccidia. The other drugs that are being discussed out there are not labeled for use in dogs in the United States. I just simply don't use them. Elbon is a very effective product if you weigh the puppy and dose it accurately. If you're guessing how much the puppy weighs or if you're not shaking up your bottle sufficiently, it's like paint, it'll settle out in the bottom. So when you get a new bottle of fenbendazole, when you get a new bottle of Albon, the recommendation is to shake it like a paint shaker and then divide it up into smaller bottles so that you have a more uniform distribution of that product as you're dispensing it to the puppies. If it's settled out and it's really thick and really stuck to the bottom, the top half of the bottle is gonna be weaker and the bottom half of the bottle is gonna be stronger. So pre-shake those bottles, get them pre-dispensed and get ready to go. But Albon is still a very effective drug against coccidia. I don't like the unlabeled drugs for coccidia or for giardia. Please, please, please stick to and Bendazole and stick to Albon because we know those are safe. And by the way, those are all oral products. I actually had a client that called us a couple of weeks ago that had inadvertently given an oral product under the skin as an injection. So please don't do that. Vaccines, we recommend vaccinating our females for distemper, adeno, parainfluenza, parvo, and lepto. Corona, only in situations where you've proven coronavirus in your kennel. Rabies, of course, required by law. Bordetella, I use the three-way Bordetella, which is Bordetella, para-influenza and adenovirus, the nose drops, the injectable or the oral don't include all three and you'll get more kennel cough if you're not using the nose drop Bordetella vaccine. And then influenza depends on your environment. Um, we had an outbreak of influenza a few years ago. We haven't seen any lately. And uh, so I would probably not use influenza unless we have another outbreak. Which vaccine should be given during pregnancy? The answer is zero. Do not vaccinate pregnant dogs. Puppy count x-rays is number three. Very important that we take good x-rays. We need to know how many puppies you're gonna have so you know at two o'clock in the morning if, it, if you can go to bed. We need to know if you're having too many or too few puppies. So if you need to schedule a C-section, you can do that. And we need to know that you're not leaving a puppy behind that you think the female is done having puppies. And it turns out three days later, she's running a fever, she's really sick. We've actually had two females that have gone to um, other veterinary clinics around us and puppies have been left behind at C-section. So be very, very aware that you need to get all the puppies out of the uterus. Um, this is a picture of a, a female that came in in labor. She had delivered some of her puppies, um, wasn't able to deliver the last puppy. We knew that from the puppy count x-ray. And you can see from this x-ray that the puppy's head is on the left, the shoulder is on the right, and the body is on the left. This puppy is trying to come out shoulder first. No amount of oxytocin or manipulation is gonna get this puppy out. This female needs a C-section. What happens, happens if a puppy gets left behind, the bitches can get really sick, they'll run a fever, they may rupture their uterus. The one client ended up with uterine rupture and almost lost her bitch. They were fortunate to save the female, but lost her reproductively in the future. Obviously you're gonna lose puppies that have been left behind for three days, but the greatest risk is to that of your female. We don't want her losing her life over a retained puppy. So very important that we know exactly how many puppies are there. And at C-section, I literally teach to every vet student that comes to us to say out loud, ovary, ovary, cervix. At the C-section, the uterus can look like it tapers down and you think you're at the end, but unless you follow it all the way to the ovary, there is a risk of leaving a puppy behind. So I tell my vet students, I do not want to read about you in the veterinary disciplinary journal of your state that you left a puppy behind. So I literally out loud every C-section, and I have done probably 10,000 C-sections in my career, I will say ovary, ovary, cervix. So I'll check each ovary. I'll put my finger down into the cervix. I wanna make sure I've got them all. So how do we get good x-rays? Well, there's a few tips that you can use to help your veterinarian get better x-rays. Number one, you wanna take her to the veterinary clinic fasting. So that's usually a morning appointment. Take her in without breakfast because food in her stomach makes it hard to count the number of puppies. 
Number two is she needs to have an empty colon. So if you walked her and she didn't have a stool, you can either put a match or a suppository in her rectum, please put it in rectally, and that will stimulate her to have a stool. I don't know who decided putting a match in a dog was a good idea, but everybody that does obedience and other performance events know that a match in the bitch's rectum will make her, well, any dog, it doesn't have to be a female, will make her have a stool. So if we take our first x-ray and there's stool in the colon, my staff doesn't take an additional x-ray, they put a match in and or a suppository in and they send her outside. And honestly, even in really nice weather, especially important when it's zero degrees out, that she will have a stool within probably three minutes of the time she goes outside. So very quickly, we can stimulate her to have a stool. Um, then we take a right and a left lateral, which may not mean anything to you, but to your veterinary clinic or your veterinary team, that means she lays on her left side down and she lays on her right side down. And we take those two x-rays back to back. I don't take x-rays with them on their back because that doesn't tell us anything about puppy counts. The, the backbone of the dog and the puppy can overlay each other so you can miss counting puppies. Digital x-rays always make it better than film and most veterinary clinics, but not all are digital now. And it needs to be after the 55th day of pregnancy. If you x-ray too early, the skeletons are too faint on the x-ray and you can't adequately see the number of puppies. So walk her before you take her in. And if she hasn't had a stool, take your book of matches along. So this is an x-ray of a dog that did not come in fasting. So you can see up here, there's a bunch of food in her stomach and it makes it really hard for us to see the number of puppies in here. So it's much more um, valuable to get an x-ray of a female that hasn't had breakfast that day. So this is the same dog. And on here, you can see that there are three puppies, one, two, three, not two that it looked like in the previous x-ray. Same with this is we take a look at this x-ray, um, sorry. Um, that we, we definitely see two puppies on this x-ray. And then when we roll her to the other side, we see one, two, three. So one, two, three, where before these two puppies were overlaying each other. And then on this x-ray, it looks like there are seven puppies. They have numbers on them. We have to put the numbers on. They don't come numbered by the way. Um, so we put a number on every puppy's skull. And on this, you can see that puppy number eight has made a magic appearance right here because when we flipped from the left side to the right side, the eighth puppy made his appearance. They're not overlapping. So super important that you work with your veterinarian. If they're not getting you an accurate puppy count x-ray, you need to work with them because they should be able to tell you exactly how many puppies they're having, unless you're above 10. Once you get above 10 puppies, I'm gonna cut them some slack and say, yeah, I'm not surprised. It can be hard to see. There's a lot of scatter, there's a lot of overlap. But if you're having smaller litters, they should be able to give you an accurate puppy count x-ray. So number four P is preparation for whelping. Again, this is a slide that you can grab your phone and take a quick picture of, or we can send this out to you afterwards. But we wanna make sure that before your bitch goes into labor or before you travel to the veterinary clinic, that you have all of your supplies together and organized. Um, it's nice to have them all in one place, especially if you don't have a litter frequently. So I keep them all in an ice chest or a storage box so that other than the ice cream, you can have everything together. You're not running all over the house trying to find the pieces and bits of things that you need to put together when you're trying to get to the vet on an emergency basis. So keep them all organized, keep them together, get your list together and get your stuff ordered well enough in advance of the appointment or the, the whelping that you don't have to call revival and ask them to overnight things to you. So be organized, be prepared. So um, very nice to have these whelping pads. These wash up beautifully. They do a great job of keeping the puppies clean and dry. I don't like to heat from above with a heat lamp. I heat from underneath. So I use this T.E. Scott whelping nest. Um, there are these available online. You can purchase these uh, with electric heat or with um, alternative heat sources if it's a, a person who doesn't have access to electricity. The surface temperature should be between 88 and 90 degrees for the first week. And then I drop five degrees a week after that so that the puppies should be very warm. The room can be at 70 to 75 degrees, but the surface where the puppies are should be at about 88 to 90 degrees. This is a litter of my corgi puppies. As you can see, a temperature gradient is important. That means that they like to be able to pick their own temperature. So they're not forced to lay on this plate. They are allowed to move around. So five of them are out here, five of them are on here. This is a litter of 13 bull mastiff puppies. They were very young and the younger they are, the more they tend to kind of um, stack together and be, be warmer. Um, I would love if my nursery looked this fancy and this organized. It does not. This is a picture I found online. Very cool. But these whelping boxes are really lovely to have. 
This is our puppy warmer incubator. And I actually talked to Ken, the, the gentleman who de, uh, developed this and is distributing this through Revival yesterday. Um, amazing piece of equipment. You will buy one of these and it will last you the rest of your breeding career. Absolutely a fantastic piece of equipment. It's very accurate in keeping puppies at the right temperature. Um, you can dial it to any uh, degree setting. So it, up here, you can set your setting and it's gonna be very accurate. The black mat in the bottom reflects the heat back so the puppies stay warm. And then associated with that, you can order the oxygen concentrator, which delivers oxygen from room air, which is 20% oxygen and makes it 95% oxygen. So that for your newborns that may um, be very, very new or wet or cold, um, or have low oxygenation capacity that by keeping them warm in here, whether they're born by C-section or vaginal birth, and then by running oxygen into the environment, you'll have these beautiful pink warm puppies and the survival rate is much higher. So great piece of equipment. There are less expensive models on the market that are made by other people. There's nothing that compares in quality to his. So all you have to do is save one or two puppies and you can easily pay for that piece of equipment. And then the rest is all bonus. Very important that we have calcium before our bitch is going to labor, it comes as a gel. Um, the gel that we use um, is very effective in improving uterine contractions. As you can see from my dog that's chewing on the tube, um, this was an empty tube that I, she found in the trash. Fortunately, it was empty. Um, this is how palatable it is. The Oral Cal Plus is very palatable. The other cal's, calcium gel product on the market is not so tasty. Um, calcium improves her labor patterns. It improves the chance she won't be aggressive toward her puppies. It improves the chance she won't be aggressive toward other people. And it improves the chances she won't develop eclampsia, which is milk fever, especially in large litters in small breed bitches. Oxytocin, again, you should have this on hand. You need TB syringes, um, tuberculin syringes. We use itty bitty tiny little doses, like a drop or two in this syringe, not an entire syringe full. So get your oxytocin and get your um, syringes ordered so that you've got that available when she goes into labor. My rules on oxytocin use are right here. Um, we use tiny, tiny little doses, like itsy bitsy, you can hardly see it in the syringe. Um, you never wanna use it before the first puppy is born. You never wanna use it if she's already in hard labor and you don't wanna exceed two doses in 20 minutes. If you've given two doses 20 minutes apart or more apart and she doesn't produce a puppy, you need to talk to your veterinarian about a C-section. If you overdose oxytocin, you're gonna shrink wrap the puppies. You're gonna run the risk of uterine rupture. I, to this day, have never ruptured a uterus in 40 years of practice, and I would like to keep it that way. Puppies free in the abdomen are dangerous for the bitch, dangerous for the puppies, dangerous for you. Don't do it. Ice cream, obviously Revival doesn't sell this. Um, very good product to have around for the glucose and the fluids. So bitches in labor don't get enough calcium from this. You need the calcium gel. But bitches in labor do benefit from the, the glucose, the sugar rush, and from the fluid because many of these girls go into labor without having eaten for 24 to 48 hours. They're weak, they're tired, they're dehydrated. A little bit of ice cream will go a long way. I usually give a scoop of ice cream and then a puppy is born. And then I give a scoop of ice cream and then a puppy is born. You still need your calcium. You might still need your oxytocin, but I generally try to whelp with as few drugs as possible and, as, and using ice cream as my glucose and my fluid source. Next is Oxymama. Um, it's an herbal product that helps to bring in the milk. It helps her to lactate better. So do other products, including bratwurst and oatmeal. Um, Reglan is another pharmaceutical agent. You need to have a prescription for Reglan. You don't need a prescription for Oxymama and you can start this three days before she goes into labor. So she's adequately producing milk when she goes into labor. Dealey mucus trap. I would never whelp a litter without a Dealey. These are $10 items in our catalog. Absolutely essential. If you're ordering one, order two, order one for your house and kennel and one for your veterinary clinic. Once you take this into your vet and show them how it works, they will never want to whelp a litter without them. Um, they are very, very useful tools. You put them in the back of the puppy's airway and you suction them. Here, Heather is showing you to be careful with your dealie because if you get it about half full and tip it, and then you suck on it, you're going to end up with that fluid in your mouth. So I would seriously avoid that. So this is a video of John showing how he's using this as a suction device. You put it about an inch in, the fluid drops into the chamber and the puppy will start squalling and breathing. So very, very effective. All you do is put one end in your mouth, the other end in the puppy's mouth. It's very intuitive how to use it. 
10 bucks. Don't whelp a litter without it. Bulb syringe doesn't do as good a job as a DOE. Dopram, this is a prescription item that you can use if the puppies aren't breathing. Again, talk to your veterinarian about that. Glucose, I like to give this to our newborns if they're weak or not doing well. You can buy it at some, some Walmarts have the Eagle brand condensed milk in a bottle. Nice way to have a flip top and you keep it refrigerated. You don't have to keep the can open. Um, Adaptil and Thunder East collars. The Thunder East collar will reduce the bitch's anxiety before and uh, during labor and during lactation. So nice product to put on the females. Um, you want to have a room thermometer with a humidity gauge on it so that you know what the temperature and the humidity in the room is where the puppies are. Rectal thermometer and Vaseline, very important that you have the ability to take temperatures on the puppies and the bitch. The puppy's rectal temperature should be 96 to 98 during the first week with it drop increasing one degree a week over the course of their first five weeks. And the temperature in the room can drop five degrees a week as they become more mature and able to run their own body temperature. Digital scale, very important that you have a scale that measures both in ounces and grams. Grams, you can see smaller incremental changes in weight gain and weight loss. So you wanna be able to measure that. And I just keep track of it on a simple notebook. If you have the ability to do an Excel spreadsheet, great. If you don't, a notebook and a piece of paper will do just fine. And then if you have trouble as the puppies get a little bit bigger weighing them, you can use a fish scale uh, with a mesh bag. And when I say fish scale, I don't mean the scales on the fish. I mean the scale you would weigh a fish with. So once the puppies get about two weeks old, they can be pretty tough to keep on a scale. So this mesh bag and scale work really nicely to, to be able to weigh your puppies. Exam gloves, please don't stick your fingers in your female without a glove on. Have some designated way to transport puppies to and from the vet clinic, ice chest, nice baby box. Um, this has a hole in it so that you can run your uh, extension cord for your heating pad out of it and has holes in the top so the puppies get enough airflow. Five hour energy. You can get this at fancy stores like truck stops. I use this if the puppies aren't breathing well when they're born. You can put a drop or two of this on the puppy's tongue and the caffeine and glucose in it will stimulate them to have a breath. Chlorhexidine, like I said, you want to bathe your bitches before they go into labor so she's clean. She doesn't have bacteria that are likely to cause her mastitis and metritis. You want to make sure you've got adequate baby bottles and adequate um, formula. This is the miracle nipple. We carry these in three different sizes. These are called amazing nipples. They do make one for cleft palate puppies. These you can buy on Facebook. We don't carry those on Revival, but we do have the miracle nipples. Work really, really great. Um, the Medi Nurser, again, a nice bottle for delivery system. And you wanna make sure you've got formula at home. Don't go out and try and make something up on your own. It's not gonna be nutritionally complete and you're gonna end up with problems with diarrhea and other nutritional deficits. So it comes as foster care. They make a kitten and a puppy version. This shaker bottle helps to break up the clumps, really cool system. So the Breeders Edge foster care is different than some of the other products on the market. They contain Biomos, Psyllium Husk and IGY. What's Biomos? Biomos is the prebiotic that feeds the good bacteria in the puppy's gut. So we're growing the right bacteria. Psyllium husk is basically fancy Metamucil. It adds bulk to the stool. So we see less diarrhea in the bitches and less diarrhea in the puppies. And then IGY supports their immune system. So the Breeders Edge foster care formulas are complete and adequate nutrition to update to day 35 of age. So like I said, if you need to make up a formula overnight to get you through the night, that's okay. But if you're planning on feeding puppies for more than a few hours, you need to have foster care. So don't wait until your bitch isn't producing milk. Get this ordered and have it on the shelf in advance. Feeding tubes, very important to have in advance. Again, you can't run to the store and pick these up. Even if you could, Walmart's not open 24 hours a day anymore. So you're pretty much stuck with what we have. So tube feeding, very important that we tube feed safely. Um, if you do want to watch this video, it's going to be on here again. It's on our learning center. So the five P's of tube feeding are pre-measure the tube, pinch before you feed, pass with the chin down, pass to the left side, and have the puppy and the formula pre-warmed. Every now and then you will have an accident tube feeding, but or you might, but you're more likely to have puppies die of starvation than tube feeding accidents. So very important that you adequately um, follow these instructions. So this is a little Rottweiler puppy that wasn't nursing adequately. Um, his owner brought him to the practice. He was one of two boys in the litter. So she brought him in because he wasn't gaining the way his brother was. So we taught her how to measure the tube. The tube has a measurement on it. As you can see, I'm gonna pass the tube. His chin is down and I'm passing to the left side. Don't throw his head back. 
and I'm passing to the mark, the black mark that's on the tube. So I pass it in and then before I feed him, I'm gonna pinch his toes and make sure that he's crying so that I can hear him. So his owner has now got the tube down him. She is very slowly putting the formula in through the stomach tube into his tummy. Um, so you can see she's holding the tube so it doesn't move out. And she is slowly and carefully feeding this kid. And so um, you can watch these videos over and over there in our learning center. If you need more help at two in the morning, they're there. But I'm, for the people that say, I don't think I should tube feed. I think there's always a puppy in the litter that's just a throwaway puppy. I don't think that they should all survive. I'm gonna show you that these are the two puppies when they're seven weeks old. This is her that was wearing the Rottweiler shirt. This is her mother. As you can see, the puppies look very much alike. And this is that puppy at nine months of age. So the run puppy should not be a throwaway puppy. Those puppies are valuable and they have a good future if you take good care of them and they just need a little nutritional help. This is our canine reproduction and neonatology book. We have that at Revival. Tincture of iodine, very important that you treat the umbilical cords at birth after you tie them off. And when I say dip the cord, by to treat it by dipping the cord, I really mean dip the cord. So we take our tincture of iodine, which is iodine and alcohol. We put the cord into the bottle and I completely encase or in surround the, the cord with the tincture of iodine. And very effectively, we can keep those puppies from having an infection in their umbilicus. Royal Canin starter mousse um, is a really nice weaning diet. This is a litter of 12 day old collie puppies that didn't have their eyes open yet. Their mother was sick with mastitis, wasn't able to adequately produce milk for her. These puppies don't have their eyes open. They've never seen solid food before. We put the Royal Canin starter mousse out of the can onto the plate. You don't do anything else with it. And they started eating. So very nice tool to have around. It's also nice to put in the bitch's water bucket if she's not drinking adequately. Warm water mixed with a can of uh, the starter mousse will get her drinking and eating better. Planning for a C-section, we've already talked about some of the progesterone timing. Um, we wanna make sure you're seeing a veterinarian with experience and staff with experience. We wanna make sure that they're using the right anesthesia, IV fluids and appropriate pain management. So scheduling it, we've talked about the timing, making sure that we know when she ovulated and then we just look at our little chart here and know what day she's due to have her puppies. We know that puppies that are born by C-section have a five to six higher percent of survival rate than puppies born by vaginal birth. This study was done by Paula Moon in 2002. Um, and you can see at birth, two hours and seven days that we see a five to 6% higher survival rate. So don't be afraid of C-sections, they can be very effective. Um, this is a litter of two pug puppies that were frozen semen produced from the highest producing stud dog pug of all time, born on Easter Sunday. We're not gonna send those to the emergency clinic. We want those to be born in our practice with control over the situation. Many emergency practices are up to their eyeballs right now and can't fit you in for emergency C-sections. So please plan for your veterinarians to take good care of you. When we're using anesthesia, I use either propofol or alfaxin to put them under with. And then I put them on sevoflurane as our gas. And then all of my bitches go home on either Medicam or Rimadil for post-op pain management. We know from Paula Moon's study that we saw the chart on that Isoflurane, sevoflurane, propofol, or alfaxin are gonna be our best anesthetic agents. If you're losing puppies, you need to talk to your veterinarian. They should not be using ketamine, dextomator, methoxyflurane, or local anesthesia as the only anesthetic agents. So we put them under with alfaxin, which is an injectable, and then we put a tube in the trachea and we put them on either iso or sevoflurane gas to maintain the females under anesthesia. Again, when we're planning them, we do them 61 to 62 days after ovulation. The day before or within an hour of the time we do this C-section, we like to give the bitches steroids called solumedrol that improves the puppy's ability to breathe when they're born. We like to give them calcium to improve maternal skills. The adaptal collar goes on three days before the C-section if it's planned, again, improving maternal skills. And Reglan, reducing the risk that she's going to reflux anything up into her esophagus or that she's not gonna lactate adequately. During the surgery, all of my bitches get IV fluids. Super important, you should expect to have your veterinary do that. Is a little bit extra money for it, but it will be much, much safer for the bitch and safer for the puppies. Um, all of my females have their bellies shaved before we put them under anesthesia, so they're under anesthesia for the shortest time possible. My team has a C-section team put together so everyone knows who's doing what during the C-section. They know who's running anesthesia, who's catching puppies, who's resuscitating puppies. It's all very organized. We have a setup on a checklist so that everything is laid out and ready to go before the C-section. 
um, we want to make sure that very quickly after the first um, drop of anesthetic is given that the puppies are out within seven to 10 minutes. We've talked about clearing the airway with the daily mucus trap. You wanna have staff that knows how they're doing this. Another reason to take cookies to your staff, your veterinary team will perform better for you if you feed them well. And we never, ever, ever spay at C-section. For post-op care, the adaptive collar improves maternal skills. Placental fluid, I save that at the C-section and put it in a bottle to send home with people. The puppies are more recognizable to the bitch if they smell like placental fluid and not laundry soap. Um, I give oxytocin after the last puppy is born to help the uterus contract down. I put them all on a non-steroidal pain medication like Medicam or Rimadyl. I try not to use Tramadol because that can make the bitches drowsy and grumpy. And we wanna make sure that you know good individual puppy care when you go to leave the hospital. We use an adhesive drape at our C-section so we don't have to scrub the nipples. Puppies can find the nipples much more effectively if the nipples haven't been scrubbed clean with a uh, surgical scrub. So we can scrub the middle and have it nice and sterile, but the edges out here are covered by the adhesive drape so the puppies can find the nipples better when the bitch is off the surgery table and she's nursing. So remember, you should not find the cheapest place to get a C-section done. Beware of bargains in parachutes and C-sections. I would not buy a used parachute on eBay. I would not pick the cheapest C-section for the place I would take my bitch. Your bitches need IV fluids. You need a good doctor. You need adequate staff to help with puppet resuscitation. You wanna use the right anesthetic drugs. You wanna never spay them. She needs to go home on pain medication. All those things cost a little bit of money. So the best C-section isn't the cheapest C-section. Super important that we're doing a good job for our C-section so that we have good outcomes. Um, these are the two books we have, Canine Reproduction and Neonatology is our book on um, everything breeding. So it goes everything from the pre-breeding screening all the way through um, picking your dog, picking your female, um, getting her pregnant, managing her pregnancy, managing the neonates, managing the male fertility, very complete book. It's about 500 pages long. My clients call it the Bible. And then this is your pandemic puppy, our newer book that's very helpful for people that are purchasing puppies from you. So you don't have to explain everything to them about crate training and leash walking and all those other bits and things. Um, about half of it's on behavior, about half of it's on medical care, like vaccinations, spaying and neutering, um, heartworm and flea and tick preventives, very up to date. It was published in November of 2021. So it's less than, it was just a little over a year old. So it's very new, very up-to-date, and it's a good way for you to educate people before they buy their puppy to make sure that they really are suited to buy a puppy and also to make sure that when you send them out their door that they have the right education and that they're getting the information that they need so that they're doing a great job taking care of the puppy that you've so carefully selected, raised, and sold to them. Thank you so much, Dr. Greer. Wow, so much great information there. Okay, so Dr. Greer, our first question, and I'm just gonna kind of do these in the order that they came in through your presentation. So Lisa is wondering, um, she'd like to know the difference between Be Strong and the Breeder's Edge in between for her. She said she's used Be Strong and she's wondering if she should be using one or the other or both. Probably both. The in-between really is meant to keep the bitches in good condition so that next time she's ready for a pregnancy, she's ready to go. But the be strong is to help bring them into heat and to manage the pregnancy. So they are complementary to each other at different stages of the female cycle. Okay. Julie is wondering, she says, we have our own progesterone machine and we have a female that has been testing seven to 11, then keeps going down and back up to around 10, basically yo-yoing. Is this normal? No, it's not. So either she's got a cystic ovary or something else going on. I'm assuming that it's only one female that you're seeing that with. So it's probably not the machine. If it's only one dog, you may want to check another dog and just see if your machine is accurate or not. Uh, but if that's what's going on, you probably need to consult with your veterinarian about the possibility of an ovarian cyst and how to get that managed. Okay, um, the next question, someone is wondering, what is the timing on the reverse progesterone testing? At what point should that be done? Well, before she goes into labor, but when you think she's getting close. So typically a day or two before you think she's due, you can do your start your reverse progesterones. But if you don't have any idea, and that's the problem is, according to the literature, bitches are pregnant 58 to 70 days. Well, that's not actually true. That's based on breeding dates. 
if you base it on ovulation dates, bitches are pregnant 63 days, plus or minus 24 hours, period, end of discussion, that's it. So you only have a 24 to 48 hour window when they're actually due. So if you think she's getting close, you can do a progesterone, but I, I really think you're gonna save money and come out ahead. If you do good timing at the beginning, then you know what day to put your um, whelping on the schedule, what day you should be um, checking her during the night, what day you should take a day off of work, what day you should go in for your C-section. You can really narrow that window down to two days with good progesterone testing at the beginning. Okay, next question. Um, somebody's wondering, what do you recommend for a pregnant dog who had Giardia as a puppy? Well, she probably still doesn't have Giardia or if she does, it's probably pretty low numbers, but you can safely use fenben Fenbendazole safeguard during the last three weeks of pregnancy. Now, Giardia doesn't pass through the placenta or through the mammary glands, but the, you know, if the female has any loose stool, any diarrhea around her tail, anything on her feet, and the puppies crawl through it, they can get Giardia when they're pretty young. So you wanna bathe your bitches with chlorhexidine. You wanna make sure she's on fenbendazole. You wanna do a hygiene clip so she's nice and clean. She doesn't have you know, clinkers hanging off of her tail. You want her good and clean when she goes into that whelping box with her new, new puppies so she doesn't spread any disease. Okay, uh, we'll do a couple more questions here. The next one, is it okay to breed 12 to 18 months? We stick with 24 months strictly, but friends breed at 18 months. That depends on your breed. The larger the breed, the later they mature. So large breed dogs tend to be a little bit later and large breed dogs that you do OFAs on, you won't get an OFA rating until the dog's at least 24 months old to get the x-ray. That being said, you can get preliminary OFAs, um, so that they will read them with 90% accuracy at about 12 months of age. You can get pen hips done to check their hip scores as early as four months of age. And if you have small breed dogs that you don't need to do hip x-rays on, people are a little bit more likely to breed young. Um, so that depends on your breed. That depends on whether you need OFA hip ratings or what, what else you need for health screenings. DNA training, screenings, you can do at any age because your dog's DNA when she's a day old is the same DNA that she is the day she dies. So you can do a DNA test as soon as they're born. And they're not, they don't have milk in their mouth. You got to have them without mom's milk to do a DNA swab. Um, the final question is, Shawnee is wondering if vaginal cytology doesn't match progesterone, does that mean there is a problem with the female? And what might cause this? She said, for example, her girl wasn't really corn fed, wasn't really cornfield when her progesterone said she was ready to breed. Yeah, cornified. A giant breed, she said. Sure. So sometimes it's the way the sample is collected. The swab should go all the way in the length of the swab. So if you have an eight inch swab, you should slide it up and forward in the vaginal tract and then spin it around. So if you're just barely getting it inside the lips of the vulva, you know, like an inch or so, you might not be getting an accurate uh, vaginal cytology. So you wanna go in all the way. I only use the swabs that have a plastic handle, not the wooden handle, because the wooden handle can splinter and break off. I have had to retrieve broken off swabs. That is really unpleasant for everyone, including the dog. So the first thing I'd look for is, are you adequately getting a cytology? And then are you rolling the swab on the slide? And is somebody that knows what they're doing reading the slide? So I would look at technique and uh, skill at reading the slide as my first differentials for what might be not correlating. Otherwise, you can every now and then see a bitch that doesn't, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I had one yesterday, it doesn't make any sense. So in those cases, I bank on progesterone more heavily than I do a cytology. I count the number, a hard number. If I get a progesterone machine that says 18.2, I'm going to believe that machine. Okay. Well, thank you again so much, Dr. Greer, for sharing all of your knowledge. And if you liked what you saw the day, love learning about pet health, I suggest signing up for our emails. I mentioned them earlier. Um, every Friday, we send educational emails and a text message if you sign up for that as well. Just kind of highlighting some of our webinars. We've done lots of webinars with Dr. Greer at this point. So we, we do webinars, articles, videos, all sorts of educational pieces. And so you can sign up for those. Go to our website at revivalanimal.com to get signed up for those. I also recommend, I know we had a few people watching us on YouTube today live, so I recommend um, subscribing to our Revival Animal Health YouTube channel, so that way, again, you'll see all these videos there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Greer, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. It was always great to be here.